I'm Dr. John Pelizari, Senior Pastor of Agape Christian Center. I want to say thank you for you personally taking your time to watch us on YouTube. We want to be a blessing to you, and anytime you tune in, I believe that every message is going to be life-changing, especially just for you. So don't forget, subscribe to us, like us, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. Let's go ahead and turn to the book of Galatians, if we will. I'm not going to do much of a recap tonight. We've been doing a very strong, if I say strong series, very strong series dealing with a lot of things in, in our lives and humanity and things we need to crucify. Uh, but it was called the cost of following Jesus. And I don't, I'm not sure what part we're on, but the cost of following Jesus. And it, it's not something that everybody can do. It's something that really leads to a crucified lifestyle. And so we've actually been talking about what it means to crucify our flesh. Gave you in Galatians chapter 5, works of the flesh. And as we were going down that list, it got really quiet in this Baptist church. And uh, so we were know we were striking something. But it's, it's only a select few in Christianity today. It's only a select few that really, really, really want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you're aware of this, but in the first century in the church, in the first century, you had to qualify to belong to a church. You had to prove that you were going to live a holy and separated life. Can you imagine what kind of power and anointing we would have in church today if we still had that kind of stuff going on? But uh, we don't. And so, therefore, we're missing some of the powers that the first century church had. But let's go to Galatians chapter 5. See if we can get out of Galatians 5 tonight. We've been talking about the crucified lifestyle, the cost of, of following Jesus. And so we're going to pick up. Now we're going to take a turn. Notice in Galatians chapter 5, verse 25, message translation. Since this is the kind of life that we have chosen. Everybody say chosen. Now everything we've talked about so far concerning this crucified life is all a choice. And that's the thing. Because Jesus said, if any man follow me. So the, the word if shows you it's our choice. We get to choose this stuff. And then again, not everybody can do that. Because churches now today have turned into bless me clubs and said, what can I do to bless him clubs? Are you getting this? All right. So if this is the life that we have chosen. Okay. The life of the spirit. It's a spirit life. Let us make sure that we do not. If I say do not. Just hold on to it, okay? Uh, uh, hold on to an idea or in our hearts like it's some kind of fancy notion or something like that. So what it's talking about here is talking about we have to make a quality decision for a quality lifestyle. And so the question that comes to my mind is if we choose to lead a crucified life and we choose to be true followers of Jesus Christ, not just pop inners or show uppers, would it be possible that the signs and wonders that we read about in the book of, in the Bible, the book of Acts and so forth, would it be possible that those things would return? Because there's two men who are going to come back, Enoch and Elijah during the apocalypse and so forth. They're going to do mighty signs and wonders, but they've been living with the word for several thousand years now. So this is a choice, but not everybody can make that choice. What I want you to see is that when we begin to live a crucified lifestyle, people around you are going to be able to say there's something different about you. Let's go to verse 26. That means we will not compare ourselves, okay, with each other. I mean, we know there's a lot of that going on. As one of us is better or one of us is worse. Now, you see this all the time. People doing the comparison trap, they do so because they want to feel better about themselves. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives, okay? Each of us is a what? An original. So when you compare yourselves, it's like you're trying to say, I'm going to deny my originality that God designed me. I want to be like everybody else. And the reason we do that is because we want to be accepted. And so what we need to do is if we focus on meeting God's standards, then wouldn't it be more likely that we would see God's uh, spirit and power operating in life because we're meeting his expectations and not the world's. Let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 24. For whosoever shall save his life, okay, shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his uh, life for my sake, then the, the same shall find it. 
So the motivator here is, are you so much in love with Jesus that you're willing to give up your life to follow him? And that's the difficult part. That's the million dollar question that faces Christianity today because not a lot of people are willing to do this kind of stuff. And because we're not willing to sacrifice or live a crucified lifestyle, the time of the signs and wonders, the book of Acts is no longer as strong and powerful as it is in other third world nations. Because in third world nations, they don't have as many options as we do. If God doesn't come through here, we've got Visa, we've got MasterCard, we've got doctors, we've got aspirins and everything else. Am I talking to anybody? Yeah. All right. So the question is, are you going to live a crucified lifestyle? Now, when people don't do this, in the book of Zephaniah, chapter 1, verse 12, the message translation basically says this. During the end times, God is going to go through every street in Jerusalem and look in every closet. And he's going to look for those who are not doing anything. The procrastinators. The ones who just think, well, what's the use? Why bother? Bother? Nothing ever going to change. Nothing's going to happen. And so for those who put off God and have refused to make a decision, it says during the time of judgment, they're going to think they're going to get away with it. But the Holy Spirit is going to sweep the streets and call these people on the carpet. Now, I don't know about you. I'd rather repent now and get my act together than I would have to wait during that time, get left behind and go through everything else. Amen? Amen. All right. So let's go to Luke chapter 9. Verse 23, King James. This is the scripture that we started out with. And, and we, excuse me, we've been dissecting this thing, so let's go a little bit more. And he said unto them, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Here's the three conditions to following Jesus. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and let him follow me. So I want a quick recap. Number one, it says that we have to uh, uh, we have to be, have to live a total surrendered lifestyle. We don't get to do it the way we want to. We don't get to handle it the way we want to. We would like to do things our way, but how many of you know God's way is always best? Doesn't mean we agree with it, because sometimes I find it hard to love my enemies and bless those who have despitefully used me. That's a hard thing to do. But if that's the way I need to do it now in this lifetime, then I know not only now in this lifetime, Will I, will I remove a blessing block in my life, but I also reap the benefits now and in the time to come? The second thing he told us to do is we need to carry our cross. And we just came out of that. That's a very difficult thing to do because we shared with you that the cross is used to crucify flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, we talk about the works of the flesh. And there was this sanctuary filled up with a lot of smoke because there was a lot of flesh burning. It got real quiet. And as you can see, we kind of called the hurt and thinned them out. Because it's a difficult walk. It's a choice. But then again, not everybody can live a crucified life. And it's very hard to do. So let's pick up the third requirement following Jesus. You have to be willing to be led. He says you have to, you have to deny yourself. You have to pick up your cross. Okay? And you have to follow me. That means you have to be willing to be led. God is going to send two things into your life to help lead you. Number one, he's going to send you the Holy Ghost. And number two, he's going to send you a pastor, a spiritual mother, a spiritual father, a mentor, a life coach, whatever you want to call them. Someone to speak into your life. And that's a difficult thing to do because we as adults, we don't want to receive correction. We don't want to... Uh, you know, have anybody speaking into our life and tell us that we did wrong or messed up. We want everybody to validate us. Go with me to the book of John, chapter 16, verse 11, New Living Translation. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. Why will He guide you into truth? Because the Bible says truth makes you free. We want the Holy Spirit to guide us into the path of least resistance. Am I talking to anybody? All right. So he'll guide you into all truth because truth will make you free. Now notice this. He will not speak of his own, but he will uh, tell you what he has heard. Okay. He will tell you about the what? The future. One of the things, one of the assignments of the Holy Ghost is to tell us about the future. Now, why would he do that? That goes all the way to the book of Genesis during the garden. There was a time when Adam and Eve were walking with God and they knew everything. They had the mind of God and so forth. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says we have the mind of Christ and we know all things. 
When they died that day spiritually, a spirit of fear came upon them. And so they hid themselves because they did not know anymore what was going to happen. They were afraid of the future, and so they hid themselves. They took matters into their own hand. And this is why one of the reasons where it says that the Holy Ghost, when He's coming, He will guide you and He will show you things to come so that fear does not have access into your life. How does that work? When you're going through a medical situation, when you're going through a trial or trauma and so forth, and the doctors are telling you this, if you'll go to the Word of God and see what the Word says about your situation, which is the truth, that truth will change the facts. Facts will change, but truth will remain. Let me put it to you this way. It was a fact that Lazarus died, but it was a truth that raised him up. Are you getting any of this? So when the Holy Ghost, if He leads you to the Word, then He's giving you the truth concerning your situation and its outcome. Now, so He's there. That's why He's called the Comforter. Once we have the truth and we know how it's going to come out, we can be at peace. So one of the ones that's going to lead you is what the, what's called in the Greek the paraclete, the one who walks beside you. How can you tell it's him? Well, the Bible says in the Old Testament it's going to sound like a voice behind you saying, go this way or go that way. He's not going to scream. He's not going to shout. He's not going to twist your arm. He's not doing anything. Like that. The Bible says it's a still, small voice. We could say it like this, Romans 9.1, that it's your conscience speaking to you. The Bible says in Romans 9.1 that our conscience bears witness with the Holy Ghost. So as God begins to train you to hear from Him, you're, He's going to speak, first of all, through your conscience, meaning you're going to have this, what the Bible calls an unction. You're going to have a feeling. We call it a hunch. I can't explain it. I just know I'm supposed to do this. And that's how you begin to get trained by the Holy Ghost to hear His voice. And as you mature in that, then all the Holy Ghost, one day you and the Holy Ghost will be walking along and He'll just say something to you. And you'll just know that it's Him. You won't go, is that you, Lord? And so it's a growing process. But the Holy Ghost is going to guide you into all truth. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 17. New Living Translation. Here's the second person that God is going to put into your life. Obey your spiritual leaders. What's that nasty four-letter word right there? Obey. Obey. That is so hard for Christians to do and it's hard for adults to do, to obey. Because we think if we're obedient, then it's weakness. But you have to understand something. Being obedient is the, is, is the most powerful show of strength that you can show in your character. Is being able to be compliant to someone that obviously knows better than we do. Obey, in this case, it's your spiritual leaders. Okay? Why? And do what they say. Many times, over the years, Pastor Karen and I, we've had people tell us, will you be my spiritual mama? Will you be my spiritual daddy? If you see anything in my life, will you tell me? Absolutely not. Not anymore. We tried doing that in the beginning, and people thought we were trying to control them, tell them what to do, all that other stuff, and they took off like horses on fire. Because nobody really in these days understands the power of mentorship and here it says that to obey spiritual leaders okay and do what they say why because they the, their work is to watch over your what souls not watching over your spirit your spirit is willing what's giving you the problem is your soul what does that mean you think too much we overthink things and so my job is to watch over your soul to help people get out of sin, to make the right decisions, to learn how to hear from God and the Holy Ghost. Okay? And notice this. And they are what? Accountable to God. So we tell people, we don't care if they get mad at us anymore, it doesn't matter why. Because you're not going to be on the judgment seat, God is. And so if I have to give an account, I don't want to stand in front of God and have to say, well, why didn't you tell him what I told you to tell him? And somebody's going to go, well, how come he doesn't tell me himself? He would, but if you, if you would stay out of sin and stop running all the time, you might hear him better. Is that too tough? Look at somebody and say, thank you, Jesus, for the truth. Okay? For they're accountable to God. So we're not here to be people pleasers. We're not politicians trying to get a vote. 
or trying to cheat the vote, however you want to look at it nowadays. Our accountability is to God. So God is going to send the Holy Spirit and He's going to send someone into your life. Usually the person that God sends into your life is someone that you are going to interpret as causing friction in your life. Because you've got rough edges that need to be rubbed off and smooth because the Bible says in Peter that we are lively stones jointly fit together. In order for us to jointly fit together and to walk in harmony, we have to rub off the rough edges. What are some rough edges? Well, some people like to control. Some people like to compare. Some people like to be oppositional. Some people like to be defiant. Some people have this attitude, you can't tell me what to do. So it's not that anybody's trying to control somebody as far as, you know, a pastor's trying to tell people what to do. We're not a cult. But our job is if we see you getting into something, that we need to say something. Because our accountability is to God. What does that mean? Well, we know what the Word says in that area, and you might not. Or the Holy Ghost may have been trying to speak it to you, but you've been ignoring Him. Turn to and say, I have never done that. And so God sends people. So you may have friction with them. They might remind you of somebody. They probably have a little bit stronger personality because that's what you need in order to hear it. Because God knows what we need. And we never think that the people that God sends into our life is for our betterment. It's to make us better believers here on this earth. And so if you have someone with a strong personality and you associate them with someone from your past, well, it's possible that that person from your past is what started you on a, on a road that was damaged all this time. And so God wants to use the very thing that damaged you to heal you. Are you getting this? Yeah. Man, it's really quiet. This is back to cost the church tonight. Yeah. All right. Because they watch over your souls. Why? Because they have to give an account to God. Okay? Give them reason to do that with joy. Some sheep, when God's going to ask me about some sheep, man, thank you, Jesus, I'm glad you sent them to our church. Other sheep, when he mentions their name, I'm going to go, oy vey, what did I do? I must have been a bad Hindu in another life. And notice this, so that, I can, so that leaders can do it with joy and not with what? Sorrow. Some folks you just can't reach. They're kicking and screaming have no idea why they keep coming, but they're kicking and screaming every step of the way. Are you getting this? So, that's going to be a tough time of accountability. That's when a, a spiritual leader stands in front of God, they're going to mention whoever was put into their life name, and that, that pastor, that spiritual leader, that spiritual mama, spiritual dad, whatever you want to call them, is going to have to tell God, they gave me a lot of headache and heartache. I tried no matter what they did. Then there's going to be some man, blue ribbon, sheep, Lord, let them live right next door to you. You see, we don't think, of, we're not eternally minded to think how this is going to play out in heaven. Can you imagine? Jesus is our intercessor, our high priest, our advocate. And Jeremiah says that God will send spiritual leaders into your life to watch over your soul, to teach you. And then in Hebrews, we're told the same thing. Can you imagine the day when that spiritual leader is called to the carpet and you're called into the office with them and you have to hear the report? Am I talking to anybody? Now, you know I'm not talking about any of you, right? We're talking about the people who aren't here tonight. All right, because they're basting their churches. Now, so to give them reason that they do it with joy and not with sorrow. Now notice this. Why? That would certainly not be for your, what? Benefit. So there's a benefit to obedience. Disobedience is a blessing blocker. Okay? So, the first one is the Holy Ghost. The second one would be a pastor, a chain of command in a church service, a spiritual mother or a spiritual father. Someone that God has sent into your life to help you, to guide you, direct you, until you learn how to walk with God on your own and are comfortable hearing His voice. Turns out three people say, you know He's talking about you. 
Now I want you to notice that it benefits you. It removes the blessing blocker. So we need to, what does that mean? It means that we need to adhere to the Bible. We need to uh, listen to the rules and regulations established and so forth. The boundaries. You know, when your parents gave you boundaries as you were growing up, it wasn't to punish you, it was to protect you. Yeah. Why? Because they knew better than we did. Now, I don't know about you, when I was a teenager, I knew everything. Oh, look at all the innocent saints in this church tonight. How many of you were a teenager and you knew everything? All right, thank you, bunch of silent sissies. So we work as a team. We're in this thing together. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 6, verse 40. The disciple is not above the master. The disciple is not above the master. That means that there comes a time when the person who's being trained or being helped out, they get the big head. And then all of a sudden they think they know better. I've had many incidences as pastoring this church where people started out and they were started as babies and we helped them grow up and they got into ministerial positions, even, you know, other leadership positions and so forth within the church. And as I continued plowing the field and, and started teaching some things that were dealing with the signs of the times because they didn't agree with it, they started a chain reaction of a bunch of difficulties. What happened? They thought they were better than the teacher. And it happens. How can you tell it happens? Because if you've been a parent and you raised a teenager, you've had the same thing happen to you. Anybody in here raise a teenager and say you were told you don't know anything? Yeah, there you go. Especially if you heard, oh, I hate you. Now, so it says that the disciple is not above the master, but, okay, uh, uh, but everyone that what? Everyone is perfect shall be his master. So it's, the word perfect there is maturio and it's talking about growing up. Growing up. Maturing as a person. And so in order to mature as a believer, God sends people into your life. You may not like their personality. You might not like their tone of voice. You may not like how to handle things. But God sends people into our lives to help us become mature believers. And when we reach an age of maturity, then he begins to send others into your life. And the cycle begins all over again. But that doesn't mean you dump your spiritual leaders. Just like you wouldn't dump the Holy Ghost. It's a continual process. It's kind of like reading the Bible. How many of you ever read the Bible from cover to cover? How many of you pick up the Bible after that and you found something new again? And then you found something new again? And then you found something new again? And then you found something new again? It's the same way with spiritual leadership and so forth. It's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. Every day is a new experience. Every day there's another lesson to be learned. Let's go to the book of Acts. Chapter 20, verse 29. Sometimes people just get the big head. Now see, let me tell you how biblical success works. I've sh shared this over the years. Biblical success means if I'm mentoring or discipling somebody, I have to bring them to the point where they're doing bigger, better, and more than I ever did. Because that's the law of discipleship. You watch me. We do it together. I watch you. Then you do it on your own, and I move to the next disciple. And Jesus said this, the rules of engagement for a true discipleship. He said, here's the law of successors and success. Greater things than these shall who do? You do. Did he say that we would do greater things? So we should be doing greater things. Some people can't even rebuke a headache. Much less identify what's flesh or what's a demon. And so Jesus gave us the law of success, greater things uh, should we do than he did. And we think, wow, that's almost blasphemous and saying, but he's the one who said it. Then what we should be doing is the Holy Spirit combined with spiritual leadership should be helping you to pass up your spiritual leader. You should be doing bigger, better, more. Are you getting this? Am I in the right place tonight? Yeah. All right. More. What a crowd tonight, Lord. All right. 
And notice this. The book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 29. Here's a word of precaution. I know that false teachers, like vicious wolves, will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. What does that mean? Well, once you begin to fly solo, people are going to start coming your way. They're going to recognize the anointing because the anointing attracts people. And they're going to want what you want. Not only are they going to want what you want, they want to take you out of the way so they can have what you work for. And so it says wolves are going to come. So that's why you need to stay connected, number one, to the Holy Ghost, and number two, to your spiritual parents, or whatever you want to call them, okay, spiritual leaders. So those who don't submit are, uh, uh, are considered to be wolves. Those who don't submit are considered to be wolves. And the Bible tells us further that they're trying to, well, look at the next verse, verse 30. Even some men, okay, from your own group will rise up, uh, rise up and what? Distort the truth so they can have a following of their own. They want to draw away a following. Some people just like people's other people's attention. Some people are in the ministry because they're called. Some people in the ministry because they like to stand up in front of the crowd and be the center of the attention. And here there's a word of warning. As you're growing up and your spiritual mentors, you know, what this reminds me of when I was taking flying lessons. The whole thing about flying lessons is not learning how to fly, it's learning how to land. Because that's the big thing. Landing is everything. And so, as I'm taking lessons and so forth, I'm learning the dynamics and everything, flying the airplane, all that stuff, radio, learning the language, the radio, use of the radio, working the pedals, flying and so forth, wind, altitude, all that stuff. And then one day I was scheduled to take a flying lesson and my mentor calls up and he goes, okay, you're gonna fly on your own today. And I had to do what's called three touch and goes. I had to take off, go up, make a pattern, come down, land, rev it back up, take off again, and do that three times successfully and that qualified me, okay, to move on to the next step. And when you do your solo touch and those three touch and goes, those landings and so forth, they cut a piece out of your, the back of your t-shirt. And they do that to remove the yellow streak if you had one. Because you were doing it without your mentor. But he was on the ground watching. And then we moved on to the next phase and so forth. But there comes a time when your spiritual leaders are going to say, okay, now you can give it a shot. Let's see what you can do. If you have any problems, come talk to me. And so as I'm doing my touch and goes and landings and so forth, it's exhilarating, but it's also scary at the same time. You've trained for it. Everything you've trained for was for this moment. And then after that came cross country. I was able to fly from here to Waco to Dallas and from Dallas to Waco and back again. I had to land at two different airports. Without my mentor, you're talking about, you know, whoo, wanting to speak in tongues. It's quite an ordeal. But that's the way it is also when you're walking with God is when God sends you the Holy Ghost. There's times when the Holy Ghost is not going to answer you. It's just going to be quiet. And you're thinking, God, where are you? And it's at that time, you can ask any teacher. When the students are being tested, they're being tested because they should know the material. And that teacher is not there to answer questions at that time. And they don't. They're there to test them. And it's the same way in our walk with God. When you get to a point in walking with God, and God perceives that, or God knows that you are ready. You may not think you're ready, but He knows that you know the Word, and that you are ready He'll let you go through something or to something without answering and you're going to wonder where is God? And it's at that time you're getting the teeth, you're getting your back cut out of your shirt to take away that yellow streak and God is showing you, you can do this because I've trained you. And that's part of leading a crucified life. It's when you go through the motions and you go through the word and you listen and you absorb 
and you follow the pattern. And then what happens, Paul gives the most weirdest advice. He said, I wish that you were all like me. What does that mean? You need to find someone to pattern yourself after. And what happens you, when you adapt their stuff, and then as you grow, their stuff will begin to wean out, and, and your personality will come through, and then you've developed the ministry. You've developed who you are in Christ. One of the things when I was a youth pastor, uh, Tommy Birchfield at the time was a preacher machine. The first time I saw him, I saw him and Miss Rachel lay out over a thousand kids. Tommy took the boys, Miss Rachel took the girls at Lakewood Church. They were youth pastors for John Osteen. And I thought, wow, this is part of the Holy Ghost I've never seen. I've seen a word of knowledge, I've seen a word of wisdom, but I've never seen this. So I went home, found out how this was done. I read Kenneth Hagin's book, How to Be Led by the Spirit of God, to find out if it was me, if it was the devil, or if it was, uh, you know, my flesh. Learned to distinguish the difference and began to put it to practice, praying for folks all the time until I found out what God was trying to show me. Are you getting any of this? I began to pattern myself after Tommy Birchfield, even his mannerisms. We started having Holy Ghost services like they did at camp. It was incredible. We've even had some in this church, in our church history. It's been incredible. But you have to be willing to be led. And that's one thing people, especially Americans, don't want to do no more. Everybody wants to be in charge. But you've got to be willing to be led to work as a team. It's you and God incorporated. Are you getting this? It's a family business. All right. So it says that there's some, they're going to come in, and they're going to just, uh, you know, instead of you know, trusting or instead of helping and so forth or getting involved, they're going to want their own little flock. And you can always tell these, the Bible calls these in the Old Testament, the confederacy. These are the ones who start coming to people, and they start talking about the flaws that they see in Pastor Karen and Pastor John, the things that are being done wrong in the church. This is too hard. Why are they doing this? I, don't, I disagree with them. Those are wolves beginning to snarl and show their teeth. It's just a matter of time before they pull somebody to the side and put those teeth around their neck. Seen it happen time and time and time again. And yet we continue to preach it and warn believers and they still fall to the wayside. When somebody begins to show you flaws, how many of you know that no one is flawless except Jesus? Okay? Nowhere does it say in the scriptures that your spiritual leader is going to be perfect. But they do have something that you could possibly partake of, and that's their anointing. It doesn't say we're called to be perfect. Are you getting this? We're not called to be perfect. Because you need to see that God uses a messed up vessel to do a holy work because that's what we all are. And so we have to be willing to be led by the Spirit of God to have someone impart into you. Now notice this. Let's go to Luke chapter 14 verse 26. Anybody learning tonight? Okay. Anyone who comes to me but refuses to what? Let go of father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters. Yes, even, uh, even one's own self cannot be my disciple. The fifth thing that you need to understand about being a follower of Jesus Christ, paying the cost, is you have to be willing to sacrifice. And that's hard. Yeah, be willing to sacrifice what? Father, mother, spouse, children, brother, sister, even your own self. That means this. They and their events don't come first. If you have an assignment or a duty or an obligation to God or in the house of God, as much as we hate to hear it, as much as is against society rules of today, God's house, God's people is first. And that's hard. Because to us, the enemy is going to say, well, you're such a bad parent. 
But that's not the truth. According to the scripture, it says that we've got to be willing to make Jesus number one. And sometimes that means you have to sacrifice. And that's hard. When your child, you ever notice that the world schedules the same sports events or things that the world has at the same time as church services? Do you think that's coincidental? That's not coincidental. That's an assignment from the enemy to separate believers. Because this, I don't know about you, is a tough scripture. <clears throat> I love my kids. I love my wife. I love my grandkids. But when it comes to this scripture, I have to love Jesus first. Are you getting any of this? Now, a recent example was when Pastor Karen got sick, got hit with COVID. She's at home, barely breathing. But I had to come and be in the house of God. I had priestly duties to perform. And I would ask her, do you want me to stay? I can make a phone call. And she even said, no, go do what you're called to do. Is that true? That's hard. I would have rather stayed home. But in order for us to fulfill this scripture, that was a sacrifice. And to try to be under the anointing, thinking at any time, I don't know if I'm going to come home and find a dead wife, was difficult. But according to this word, God had to be first. Now see, in our society, that sounds cold-blooded. But there's going to come a time, the Bible says, that during the tribulation period, mamas are going to have to make decisions whether to take the mark in order to get their child milk or watch them, watch their child start to death. Do I want to take the mark and save my family or do I want to get beheaded for the cause of Christ? See, we ain't seen nothing yet, folks. This is all coming down the pipeline. We have to be willing to make sacrifices. And this is what the arena that we're entering into, this is what the spirit of Antichrist is setting up, making a sacrifice. And that's hard. Because I love my wife, but if I have to go to the guillotine, I'll see you in a couple of minutes. Are you getting this? Notice how quiet it got in here? Because it says, anyone who wants to come after me, okay, but refuses to let go father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even oneself. How many times have you ever just didn't want to do anything? I don't feel like going to church. I don't want to pray with people. I want to be Oscar the Grouch today. I don't want to get dressed. I don't want to go to the hospital and pray for someone. I just want to want to because I want to want to. But it says you have to deny yourself. I don't want to deal with people that are belligerent, unthankful, ungrateful. I don't want to deal with them. But according to this, I have to. I have to love the unlovable. That's denying myself. Because I would rather tell them off. Does anybody know where that's coming from? But well, we can't. Many times, I don't know about you, I've had the tongue, my tongue pressed against the back of my teeth trying to find a gap to squeeze through. Blood trickling out, trickling out because I just wanted to tell them how the cow chews the cut. But well, we can't. Why? Because I have to deny myself. And that is hard because in today's society, we have no problem going off on people. And that's a difficult thing to do. The world will schedule a soccer game, a softball game, the same time that we have to be in the house of God. Super Bowl Sunday, sports activities, football games, all on Sundays. What's wrong with Saturday? Nothing. 
It's all a design. Originally, we didn't have to have two income families. Originally, a husband went to work, the mom stayed home, the kids were happier, more healthier, but somehow or another, the enemy worked it in, so everybody had to have a two income family, and now we have to have strangers raising our children and grandchildren, and paying them. And more than likely, they're probably on the cell phone, not thinking Junior or Juniorette is cute. But just because they act friendly at the door, we think they're in good hands. What is that? It's a satanic ploy to bring disruption and disharmony to the family. And so it takes sacrifices. God, I have to trust you. When the Lord called me into the ministry, I told the Lord, okay, but you're going to take care of my sons. If I'm going to do this, then I'm going to enter into a covenant. I'm going to enter a contract with you. Make sure my kids are taken care of. That they'll grow up and one day understand the sacrifices I had to make in order to work and everything else. Holding down four jobs, paying bills, taking care of stuff, having to preach, do the ministry. It's tough when you miss a softball game, when you miss a soccer game. It's hard when you can't go to a graduation sermon. It's difficult. And so not everybody can fulfill this scripture. This is one of the toughest scriptures of self-denial and being crucified that is ever written in the confines of the scripture because it's so hard for people to grasp. You mean to tell me I've got to put Jesus first in everything according to this? Yes. Even myself? Well, yeah. And so we don't see very many people living a crucified lifestyle. This is too tough. Would you admit with me? This is a tough scripture. It's tough scripture. It's hard. Okay? But this is what disqualifies most people. I've got people right now. They want to they do ministry here. But they don't come to church. They pop in occasionally. Yet they want to be in leadership. If you... If I, you can't trust them with sheep, with popping. Can you imagine you scheduled surgery with your doctor, but you don't know if he's going to come in or not? You don't know if he's going to be there, or the anesthesiologist, or the nurse. Let's just hope that they come. Why? Because they can't make sacrifices. My time doesn't belong to me. It belongs to him. My money doesn't belong to me. It belongs to him. My family doesn't belong to me. It belongs to him. My wife doesn't belong to me. It, she belongs to him. My energy, my resources doesn't belong to me. I would love for it to belong. The only thing I claim is my, my video game console. That's it. Are you getting any of this? In order to self-sacrifice. Think about whom or what you live the most and ask, can I live without this from now on to pursue Jesus? That's hard. And Jesus is saying, I've got to be above everything and anyone else. And to us, that's psychotic. We can't fathom that. But what God is calling us on the carpet here is, if I'm going to agape love you unconditionally, can you love me unconditionally back? And that's what it's boiling down to. Turn someone and say, I love Pastor John. Yeah, you know I didn't write this stuff, right? All right. Let's do one more verse. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. If you prefer father or mother over me, okay, you don't deserve me. Let's, let's make it different. If you prefer to sleep over me, you don't deserve me. If you try to fit me into your schedule over putting, making me your schedule, you don't deserve me. If you put off what I've asked you to do instead of doing what I called you to do, you don't deserve me. That's hard. But this is what he's talking about. Okay? If you prefer father or mother over me, you don't deserve me. 
if you prefer son or daughter over me, you don't deserve me. If you don't, if you don't go all the way with me, okay, through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. Turn to someone and say, Pastor John didn't write that. Can we be honest? This is a stout scripture that's not preached in churches anymore. Because it calls us to the carpet. Can you live a crucified life? There's been times, let me give you some examples. There's been times I've been saving up for something. I'll save up for something. And I'm almost there. And I'm thinking, woohoo! Shopping we will go. Shopping we will go. Hi, ho, the merry Anybody know what I'm talking about? And then somebody will say something. And the Holy Ghost said, why don't you give them your money? Now the first thing I'd like to say is I rebuke you. Get thee behind me. Anybody ever go through that? It's deny me. That's painful. But we have to be obedient. Because let me tell you how I know it's God. My flesh would not say, why don't you give that to someone else? Your flesh wouldn't either. And that's denying self. And that type of crucified lifestyle has become a very rare commodity on our planet. Is it possible that's one of the reasons Jesus said that when he returns, will he find faith on this, on, on this planet? And see, the thing about this whole thing this is a tough message. This is not easy. But it will only appeal to those who are radically or desire to be radically sold out for God. There's a saying that says the whole world has yet to see what can happen with one believer who's completely sold out to God. That means this. You own nothing. You call the shots a nothing. Your time is not your own. Your resources is not your own. It's all Him. Anytime, anywhere, at any cost. That's a crucified lifestyle. And that's kind of like the Marines. Only the few, the bold and the chosen can do that. Because it's not for everybody. Because it means having to make a decision that is very painful. Let me just entreat you. I'll close with this. If the Lord has been speaking to you concerning this kind of crucified lifestyle, I will say this. When Jesus said, if you're willing to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you'll lay it down, you'll gain it back. That part is very true. Because once you've made the decision and you become tested on turning your life over to Him and you pass those tests, everything you thought you had to give up, He gives it back. But there will be a test. But once you make that decision, your life radically changes to a different level of Christianity that people are not aware of. You'll see the supernatural of God sometimes on a daily basis. Something's always happening. You can count on it. But it, there's a cost. Surrender. Be led. Take up the cross. Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you for giving me an easy message tonight. I know this is a difficult for the hearing, Father. But I believe with all of my heart you've been speaking to someone about leading a crucified lifestyle. About denying themselves and picking up the cross and following you. That you're looking for that last generation, last hour disciple to do a work that needs to be done. And so, Father, I pray for him, for her, for them, that you'll begin to just speak to them in a very clear and audible way. 
concerning a crucified lifestyle and let them know that the temporary sacrifice is nothing compared to the glory that they will experience. I pray that you give them strength, courage to face the challenges, to answer the call. And Lord, we thank you that they're going to enter into a time of the miraculous and the supernatural, a time of blessings in Jesus' name. Father, we also thank you for this weekend as we enter into a time of thanksgiving. We also pray for the life of our president as the enemy tried to take him out and as they're making threats for Sunday, we pray for the safety of your people, of this great nation. We give you the praise and the glory. And Father, we thank you that everything is going to work out for our good. We're living in the time that the saints have longed for, the time of the end. And we thank you that we're going to see your hand moving mightily in the days ahead. Until you return and take us home. We thank you for all of this. For taking care of our needs. Healing our bodies. We thank you for tomorrow. The time of thanksgiving and fellowship. And family. We pray that Psalms 91.10. That no plague shall come nigh our dwelling. And we give you all of the praise and the glory. Lord. Amen and amen. amen. If God has been nudging you. Taking on you texting you pick up the phone it'll turn out good amen did you learn something tonight